For the last decade, I've been teaching the permaculture design course as laid out by Bill Mollison in the Permaculture Designer's Manual, which he wrote in the 1980s. And it's interesting to have this book and to go back to it on a regular basis and contemplate some of the stuff that Bill was writing in this book for lots of reasons. Number one, we give this book out in our 72-hour permaculture design course. And resoundingly, I hear the same comment from students over and over again, which is, oh my gosh, this book is so hard to read. It's so dense. And it's just not something that you would ever think of reading from cover to cover. And and uh, in some ways, I agree with them on that level. But as you mature along your permaculture journey, what you start to realize is that Bill was so far ahead of the pack that uh, his book just constantly gets larger. In fact, that was a quote that Jeff Lawton gave me when I was studying at the Permaculture Research Institute in Australia, was that the design manual perpetually gets bigger as you use it more. And I had no idea what he was telling me when he said this. And so recently, I was contemplating some of the things that are happening globally, which we don't need to get into in this episode in any kind of detail. But there's an awful lot of conversation going on right now around ethics, Um, whether you're listening to Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson or any number of these other philosophers. And I would argue that there's an awful lot of stuff happening that is completely unethical in the world. And again, we could literally spend an entire episode talking about that. So I'll leave you to research these unethical happenings. I don't think you can say it much more simply than Bill says in the design manual. And so in this episode, I thought I would just read a few passages from chapter one in Permaculture Design Manual. And I think you'll find it really enlightening. If you stick right till the end, I will uh, give a little preamble on some of the things that stand out for me in this passage. But I'd encourage you to just sit down and press play and have a listen. If you're a YouTube premium subscriber, you won't be bothered by ads. And as well, you can download this and listen to it offline if ever you want to contemplate it again. So grab a cup of tea and sit down and have a listen. And as always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. And if you get some value out of this, please hit the like button. It helps the channel to track. The sad reality is that we are in danger of perishing from our own stupidity and lack of personal responsibility to life. If we become extinct because of factors beyond our control, then we can at least die with pride in ourselves. But to create a mess in which we perish by our own inaction makes nonsense of our claims to consciousness and morality. There is too much contemporary evidence of ecological disaster which appalls me, and it should frighten you too. Our consumptive lifestyle has led us to the very brink of annihilation. We have expanded our right to live on earth to an entitlement to conquer the earth, yet conquerors of nature always lose. To accumulate wealth, power, or land beyond one's need in a limited world is to be truly immoral, be it as an individual, an institution, or a nation-state. What we have done, we can undo. There is no longer time to waste, nor any need to accumulate more evidence of disasters. The time for action is here. I deeply believe that people are the only critical resource needed by people. We ourselves, if we organize our talents, are sufficient to each other. What is more, we will either survive together, or none of us will survive. To fight between ourselves is as stupid and wasteful as it is to fight during times of natural disasters when everyone's cooperation is vital. A person of courage today is a person of peace. The courage we need is to refuse authority and to accept only personally responsible decisions. Like war, growth at any cost is an outmoded and discredited concept. It is our lives which are being laid to waste. What is worse, it is our children's world which is being destroyed. It is therefore our only possible decision to withhold all support for destructive systems and to cease to invest our lives in our own annihilation. The prime directive of permaculture, the only ethical decision, is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children. 
make it now. Most thinking people would agree that we have arrived at final and irrevocable decisions that will abolish or sustain life on this earth. We can either ignore the madness of uncontrolled industrial growth and defense spending that is in small bites or large catastrophes eroding life forms every day, or take the path to life and survival. Information and humanity, science and understanding, are in transition. Long ago, we began by wondering mainly about what is most distant astronomy and astrology were our ancient preoccupations. We progressed millennia by millennia to enumerating the wonders of the earth, first by naming things, then by categorizing them, and more recently by deciding how they function and what work they do within and without themselves. This analysis has resulted in the development of different sciences, disciplines, and technologies, a welter of names and the sundering of parts, a proliferation of specialists, and a consequent inability to foresee results or to design integrated systems. The present great shift in emphasis is on how the parts interact, how they work together with each other, how dissonance or harmony in life systems or society is achieved. Life is cooperative rather than competitive, and life forms of very different qualities may interact beneficially with one another and with their physical environment. Even the bacteria live by collaboration, accommodation, exchange, and barter. Lewis Thomas, 1974. Permaculture principle of cooperation. Cooperation, not competition, is the very basis of existing life systems and of future survival. There are many opportunities to create systems that work from the elements and technologies that exist. Perhaps we should do nothing else for the next century but apply our knowledge. We already know how to build, maintain, and inhabit sustainable systems. Every essential problem is solved, but in the everyday life of people, this is hardly apparent. The wage slave, peasant, landlord, and industrialist alike are all deprived of the leisure and the life spirit that is possible in a cooperative society which applies its knowledge. Both warders and prisoners are equally captive in a society in which we live. If we question why we are here and what life is, then we lead ourselves into both science and mysticism, which are coming closer together as science itself approaches its conceptual limits. As for life, it is the most open of open systems, able to take from the energy resources in time and to re-express itself not only as a lifetime, but as a descent and an evolution. Lovelock, 1979 has perhaps best expressed a philosophy or insight which links science and tribal beliefs. He sees the earth and the universe as a thought process or a self-regulating, self-constructed and reactive system creating and preserving the conditions that make life possible and actively adjusting to regulate disturbances. Humanity, however, in its present mindlessness may be the one disturbance that the earth cannot tolerate. The Gaia hypothesis is for those who like to walk or simply stand and stare, to wonder about the earth and the life it bears, and to speculate about the consequences of our own presence here. It is an alternative to that pessimistic view which sees nature as a primitive force to be subdued and conquered. It is also an alternative to that equally depressing picture of our planet as a demented spaceship forever traveling, driverless and purposeless around an inner circle of the sun. J. E. Lovelock, 1979. For every scientific statement articulated on energy, the Aboriginal tribes people of Australia have an equivalent statement on life. Life, they say, is totality neither created nor destroyed. It can be imagined as an egg from which all tribes, life forms, issue and to which all return. The ideal way in which to spend one's time is in the perfection of expression of life to lead the most evolved life possible, and to assist in and celebrate the existence of life forms other than humans, for all come from that same egg. The totality of this outlook leads to a meaningful daily existence in which one sees each quantum of life eternally trying to perfect an expression towards a future, and possibly transcendental perfection. It is all the more horrific, therefore, that tribal people whose aim was to develop a conceptual and spiritual existence, 
have encountered a crude scientific and material culture whose life aim is not only unstated, but which relies on pseudo-economic and technological systems for its existence. The experience of the natural world and its laws has almost been abandoned for closed, artificial, and meaningless lives, perhaps best typified by the dreams of those who would live in space satellites and abandon a dying Earth. I believe that unless we adopt sophisticated Aboriginal belief systems and learn respect for all life, then we lose our own, not only as a lifetime, but also as any future opportunity to evolve our potential. Whether we continue without an ethic or a philosophy, like abandoned and orphaned children, or whether we create opportunities to achieve maturity, balance, and harmony, is the only real question that faces the present generation. This is the debate that must never stop. A young woman once came to me after a lecture in which I wondered at the various concepts of afterlife, the plethora of heavens offered by various groups. Her view was, this is heaven right here. This is it. Give it all you've got. I couldn't do better than that advice. The heaven or hell we live in is of our own making. An afterlife, if such exists, can be no different for each of us. Ethics. In earlier days, several of us researched community ethics, as adopted by older religions and cooperative groups seeking for universal principles to guide our own actions. Although many of these guidelines contained as many as 18 principles, most of these can be included in the three below, and even the second and third arise from the first. The Ethical Basis of Permaculture Number 1. Care of Earth Provision for all life systems to continue and multiply. Number two, care of people. Provisions for people to access those resources necessary to their existence. Number three, setting limits to population and consumption. By governing our own needs, we can set resources aside to further the above principles. This ethic is a very simple statement of guidance and serves well to illuminate everyday endeavors. It can be coupled to a determination to make our own way, to be neither employers nor employees, landlords nor tenants, but to be self-reliant as individuals and to cooperate as groups. For the sake of the earth itself, I evolved a philosophy close to Taoism from my experience with natural systems. As it was stated in Permaculture 2, it is a philosophy of working with rather than against nature, of protracted and thoughtful observation rather than protracted and thoughtless action, of looking at systems and people in all of their functions rather than asking only one yield of them, and of allowing systems to demonstrate their own evolutions. A basic question that can be asked in two ways is, what can I get from this land or person? Or, what does this person or land have to give if I cooperate with them? Of these two approaches, the former leads to war and waste, and the latter to peace and plenty. Most conflicts, I find, lay in how such questions are asked and not in the answers to any question. Or, to put it another way, we are clearly looking for the right questions rather than for the answers. We should be alert to rephrase or refuse the wrong question. It has become evident that unity in people comes from common adherence to a set of ethical principles, each of us perhaps going our own way at our own pace and within the limits of our own resources, yet all leading to the same goals, which in our own case is that of a living, complex, and sustainable earth. Those who agree on such ethics, philosophies, and goals form a global nation. How do a people evolve an ethic, and why should we do so? Humans are thinking beings with long memories, oral and written records, and the ability to investigate the distant past by applying a variety of techniques, from dendrochronology to archaeology, pollen analysis, and geological sciences. It is therefore evident that behaviors in the natural world which we thought appropriate at one time later prove to be damaging to, to our own society in the long term. For example, the effects of biocidal pest controls on soils and water. Thus, we are led by information, reflection, and careful investigation to moderate, abandon, or forbid certain behaviors and substances that in the long term threaten our own survival. We act to survive. 
conservative and cautious rules of behavior evolved. This is a rational and sensible process responsible for the taboos in tribal societies. From a great many case histories, we can list some of the rules of use. For example, rule of necessitous use, that we leave any natural system alone until we are, of strict necessity, forced to use it. We may then follow up with rules of conservative use. Having found it necessary to use the natural resource, we may insist on every attempt to reduce waste and hence pollution, thoroughly replace lost minerals, do a careful energy accounting, and make an assessment of the long-term negative biosocial effects on society and act to buffer or eliminate these. In practice, we evolve over time to various forms of accounting for our own actions. Such accounts are fiscal, social, environmental, aesthetic, or energetic in nature, and all are appropriate to our own survival. Consideration of these rules of necessitous and conservative use may lead us step by step to the basic realization of our interconnectedness with nature that we depend on good health in all systems for our survival. Thus, we widen the self-interested idea of human survival on the basis of past famine and environmental disaster to include the idea of the survival of natural systems and can see for example, that when we lose plant and animal species due to our own actions, we lose many survival opportunities. Our fates are intertwined. This process, or something like it, is common to every group of people who evolve a general earth care ethic. Having developed an earth care ethic by assessing our best course for survival, we then turn to our relationships with others. Here, we observe a general rule of nature that cooperative species and association of self-supporting species like mycorrhizal, like mycorrhiza on tree roots make healthy communities. Such lessons lead us to a sensible resolve to cooperate and take support roles in society, to foster an interdependence which values the individual's contribution rather than forms of opposition or competition. Although initially we can see how helping our family and friends assists us in our own survival, we may evolve the mature ethic that sees all humankind as family, and all life as allied associations, and thus we expand people care to species care, for all life has a common origin, all are family. We see how enlightened self-interest leads us to evolve ethics of sustainable and sensible behavior. These then are the ethics expressed in permaculture, having evolved ethics we can then devise ways to apply them to our lives, economics, gardens, land, and nature. And this is what this book is about. The mechanisms of mature ethical behavior or how to act to sustain the earth. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully you found that as insightful as I did. It's always great to go back into old books and reread passages that you haven't necessarily read for a long time. I think that Bill really hits the nail on the head in this uh, passage, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to read it to you. You know, we are surrounded by different religions and different philosophies and science and, and a whole bunch of people trying to make sense of what ethics are. Do ethics require a religious belief? Can you establish ethics based on scientific principles? what is a set of ethics? And when I first went into permaculture, I kind of thought this concept of ethics was silly. Even though it was the primary reason that I was there, I was feeling the need to have some sort of a central ethic to guide my life by, which I had not necessarily received um, directly as a result of growing up. Although I felt it intrinsically within myself, I just didn't have words to put to it. As I have evolved in my permaculture thinking, what I've recognized is that ethics are actually one of the most important things, because as Bill says, that a people who live without a common ethic are neither a nation nor a community. Um, and yet, if you live with a common ethic, it doesn't matter what part of the planet you live on, um, that is a true uh, community or nation of people, uh, irregardless of the country that you, you, you find yourself in. And so these three ethics are pretty profound because it actually doesn't matter what religion you believe in, what philosophy you exist by, we all ultimately want the same things. We want our kids to go to college or university or whatever that higher education piece is for them. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be happy. We want them to be successful, however they define that success. 
And when we are working to our own destruction by looking at the planet and the destruction that we create as externalities, as opposed to eliminating options, as Bill puts, it seems a little bit insane and suicidal. And so I think that that's kind of the primary thrust of this of this piece here, and um, ultimately based around his two principles, the principle of cooperation. So cooperation, not competition, is the very basis of existing life systems and the future of our survival, which I think is is super crucial. And then the other principle, which was actually before that, was the prime directive of permaculture, and, and that is the only ethical decision is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children. I especially like the prime directive because what I find with that particular piece of information or that principle is that I get a lot of people who are in one way or another dealing with severe mourning, mourning of the planet, mourning of their life, mourning of their lack of ethics, not because they've consciously gone out and tried to not have ethics, because they, but because they were missing the very thing that I was missing when I found permaculture, which was a, a way to think about how to live my life in an ethical way, which is taking care of people and taking care of the earth. And so uh, in the environmental movement, we tend to focus on blaming our problems on other people. Um, a lot of environmental agencies um, do a really good job of this, making us feel guilty for being alive. And this perpetuates through all sorts of vernacular and, and phrases and catchphrases, things like net neutral housing or zero escaped landscapes, basically implying that at best humans can be less destructive, as opposed to um, portraying uh, possibilities and options on how humans can actually be more positive. In fact, we can be just as positive as we are negative. And more importantly, we don't have the right to blame our problems on other people if our home and garden is not in order. What's really interesting is that most of our homes and gardens these days are designed to consume. They consume energy. They consume money to pay for that energy. They grow absolutely no productivity. In fact, we chop grass and then send it to landfill. And then because we're extracting nutrients out of the soil, we go off to Home Depot, buy more nutrients in order to grow more grass and then use more fossil fuel to cut it. And it's just completely insane. It's an insane cycle versus finding ways to build houses that actually pay for themselves. So they capture their own energy from the sun. They harvest rainwater from the roofs. They collect solar electricity from photovoltaic panels on the roof. Uh, heat themselves by the correct placement of windows. They hold on to energy in the wintertime and they keep the extra energy in the summertime out of them so that we don't need air conditioners. The lawn is replaced with elements that produce food that saves us money, which means that we can spend more time with our families or pursuing hobbies, as opposed to being a, as Bill Mollison says in this passage, a wage slave paying a mortgage, which by the way, in French, mort means death, and gage means pledge, so death pledge. We have roughly 600,000 hours of life energy on this planet, each and every one of us, if we live a full and average life. And most of us will spend up to a third of that life energy pursuing jobs that we may not like in order to pay for houses that we don't really want or that aren't actually meeting um, the needs of our existence. And so really at its core, permaculture is about that care of earth, care of people and return of surplus and how to create systems that allow us to fulfill those ethics, but also allow us to take care and responsibility for ourselves. And so one of the things that I found when I left the conventional kind of oil and gas world or conventional world in itself was that my level of optimism went up dramatically because now I wasn't focused on all these external problems that I have no control over. I focused entirely on the problems that I did have control over, the ones that I had agency to change, the ones that would improve my quality of life and the quality of life of the people around me. And so this first chapter in the design manual is probably one of the most poignant pieces of writing in the entire book. And one that's worth contemplating for a long period of time with regards to how it relates to your life. I should note that this book was written first and then Bill then wrote the introduction to permaculture, which was a revision and a summary of the design manual, which is a wonderful book and I still highly recommend it. So in the introduction to permaculture, he says that the third component, which he's referring to the third ethic, 
The third component of the basic care of earth ethic is the contribution of surplus time, money, and energy to achieve the aims of earth and people care, which I feel is a better way of describing the third ethic um, than the one that he's described in the design manual. So essentially it's care of earth, care of people, and reinvestment of the resources back into those ends. So the last point that I want to make on this is the differentiation between an environmentalist and a permaculturist. And I believe that both are needed, but I believe that they come at the problem in completely different ways. Environmentalism, and I've been part of that movement, generally is there to save the earth at any cost, even if that cost is human life. And there's a strong belief or guilt that exists within that philosophy of environmentalism that humans are inherently destructive and they are a, a darth or a plague on the planet. Whereas permaculture comes at it from the perspective that we are actually of this earth. We belong here. We were born of it. And we just kind of went wrong somewhere along the way. And we lost our ethics or we evolved a different ethic for various reasons. And so it's a course correction, basically acknowledging that humans can be positive and constructive and regenerative, but we have to get the design right. And so it is a design science. It's a design system. And its aim is to design all human needs while enhancing ecosystemic health. So that's how we provide for power, water, how we turn waste into resource how we design and build shelter, how we manage forests, how we grow our food, how we commune with each other. Everything that humans need can be designed in a way that is not destructive. And a lot of times people get really confused with permaculture and just think of it as some sort of a gardening system. So I want to leave you with a quote from Bill Mollison, one of his favorite quotes of mine, and it's this. I teach self-reliance, the world's most subversive practice. I teach people how to grow their own food, which is shockingly subversive. So yes, it's seditious, but it's peaceful sedition. Bill Molson. I really think that what Bill is getting across in this first chapter is just that. And if you're overwhelmed by the scale of the problems and the state of the earth, the best thing for you to do is to literally look right outside your back door and figure out what it is that you can do to get your home and garden in order so that it shelters and feeds you and take responsibility for your children and your family because there's an enormous amount of opportunity out there and it doesn't have to be negative and pessimistic. It can actually be very positive. And one thing that I always leave my permaculture design courses off with is that if we're going to change the world, it has to taste better. It's got to be more fun, and it cannot be imbued with guilt. Thanks so much, guys. I hope you got something out of that. Please leave any comments that you have below, and we'll see you in the next episode.